Hello, everyone. I'm Kat Timph, along with Eric Bowling and Ebony K. Williams. We are the Fox News Specialists. Lots of breaking news today. Chaos in Manila, the capital of the Philippines, after gunshots and explosions ring out at a major hotel and casino. We'll have an update on that shortly. But first, a short time ago, President Trump dropping a climate deal bombshell. As of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. This includes ending the implementation of the nationally determined contribution and, very importantly, the Green Climate Fund, which is costing the United States a vast fortune. I'm not very surprised by this at all. <laughs> no, no one should be. Um, Donald Trump candidate uh, ran on the anti-globalist agenda. This, by definition, is a globalist idea. The Paris Climate Accord, 195 countries. And we're going to get into the specifics of it in, in a couple of minutes. But no one should be surprised. That, and don't be surprised also the coincidence of a brand new stock market high on the very day that we pull out. Because pulling out of the Paris Accord is very, very good for American business. We can argue whether he should get back in with a better deal or not, but certainly business leaders um, feel optimistic that this is a good idea for the country. I think get back in with a better deal, but involving Congress, as you would with a treaty, which essentially is what this was, even though technically not, should have been always treated that way. That's my opinion. Yeah, and I think most people would agree with you there. I, here's the thing. I'm not bothered at all by this. This is exactly what he ran on. Eric's right. And even those th that, that question, you know, Donald Trump and his issues with climate change or whatever, the point is the deal itself wasn't mm -hmm. good. Every deal is not good. I think a lot of people don't really wrap their heads around that um, because the idea of a deal sounds like a good thing. It sounds positive and productive, but a deal's only as good as the terms it's based on. And this one has unenforceable bad terms that are not productive for American citizens. All right. Well, let's meet today's specialists. She is a New York Times bestseller. She's a Fox News contributor and she's editor for townhall.com, but she specializes in hunting and rafting on the Colorado River. Katie Pavlich is here and he is the 1987 Brooklyn Spelling Bee champion, <laughs> the subject of the graphic novel Ego and Hubris. And he's a columnist for The Observer, but he specializes in North Korea. That's right. He's the author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il. Michael Malice is here also. All right. Katie, a lot of people are saying that the whole world is now going to be on fire. Do you yeah. think that that's true? No, <laughs> it, it is not. Uh, the hysteria surrounding the United States leaving the Paris Climate Accord really is incredible, especially considering all the hysteria we've seen so far with the Trump administration. We have commentators at different networks saying this is the day that the United States stepped back and is, is no longer the leader of the free world. You have Tom Steyer, who, of course, is a big climate change proponent, saying uh, that the president has committed an act of treason against the American people for pulling out of this accord. Um, that's not true. And when you look at the details of what this agreement would have required, you know, 400,000 manufacturing jobs in this country gone, not to mention maybe millions potentially down the road. Uh, a decrease of $20,000 per family of four in terms of household income. $3 trillion of, of lost GDP, according to, to the agreement. And the issue also is the international community seems very upset that we're leaving. Well, what if the United, if the United States pulls out? Well, then other countries might pull out. Well, first of all, that shows that we're still leaders in the world, <laughs> number one. And second of all, the United States for a very long time has been the funder of pet projects and slush funds for the international community that actually don't do a lot of good and don't handle the problem that it's supposed to. I think that the president sent that message on the campaign trail that those days are over, and this is the first step to stop American taxpayer funding to go towards one of those slush funds that really wasn't going to solve the problem of climate change. Right, absolutely. And I, again, climate change, I am someone who certainly believes that it's real. I just really don't buy into the idea that regulations are always the answer. I'm 
more one of those market people. I think things like property rights could get involved. And also, you can't have all these regulations if you want to create new businesses. And that includes businesses that are green energy. So I, I, I would like to see there be some sort of deal, though, Eric. Something you said was if we get back in, I would like to see there be some sort of deal, but follow the proper, following the proper channels of a treaty. Let's just talk a little bit. Katie points out that uh, both the Heritage Foundation and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimate the GDP lost somewhere on two and a half or three trillion dollars over 10 years. That is substantial. But here's why. I mean, th let me explain exactly why it costs us GDP when a, a lot of this is focused on the automobile industry. So all these car companies are being told they have to increase cafe standards. It's their miles per gallon standards. So they're forced to make a lighter and lighter car. Costs a lot more money to use aluminum in a car than steel. So it costs them more. That goes on to the consumer. But also these cars are less safe. So the insurance costs are going up to, to, to consumers as well. Um, also, natural gas is being forced. Now, if you're if, uh, under the accord, we'd have to pollute less, so we'd have to move away from coal, which is one of our cheapest, most abundant fuel sources in America, into a more expensive fuel source. That means our electric bills are going to go right. up as well. As these costs are translated to the consumer, GDP goes down. You have less money to in be, your But, Michael, I want to get Michael in this, too. But here's my thing, Eric. I don't mind it being more expensive because I think to do the right thing by our, our system, our ecosystem, it's going to maybe be more expensive. That's not even my problem with the deal. You know what it is? It's not enforceable. Those that don't uh, agree to it, those that violate the terms of this agreement, how are you going to enforce it's it? It's worse. the same right. kind of country it's that worse. ends up actually yeah. following worse. through on we, it. We were going to eat most of the cost of there, a big portion of the cost of this, as I, I think we're the third largest polluter, second or third largest polluter, second. the largest pr polluter, China gets to continue to pollute more and more and more for 13 years going forward. But I do think it's, it's insane. I do think it's important, Michael, to show that we do still care about this. We don't want to completely abandon look after clean energy, green energy, because that is where the rest of the world is going. If we just want to stick with coal, we'll be by ourselves sticking with coal, and that's not a good thing. Well, we're by ourselves using feet and yards, and that's mm -hmm. pretty fine with me. See, I agree with <laughs> I Katie. This that. isn't about leadership. This is about obedience and submission of the American government, the American people to a new world order. Now, here's how I determine what the facts are here. If you look at markets, price determines information. If aluminum goes up, that means there's either less demand, uh, there's more demand or less supply. If you look at all these predictions, they say that we're all going to be underwater and we should have been underwater in the 90s. Mm -hmm. If this was all true, beachfront property prices would be collapsing because all those people in the real estate industry would be selling because they're thinking the long game and they're like, well, these, this is going to be worth yeah. in 20 years and we're not seeing that. So I trust the people. The views are too nice. I trust people who have skin in the game, not the coal industry people right. and not certainly not people who want the government to control every aspect of our lives. Listen, if you agree with the French proposals, put on a beret, go to go to Calais and pay 85% of your income to the French government. Understand this also. Elon Musk said that if we pulled out of the um, the Paris Accord, that he was going to pull himself self off of some of the advisory boards that he's on with the Trump administration. Think about that for a second. The guy who runs an electric car company, owns right. an electric car company, Just funded, subsidized, subsidized by largely <laughs> by the U.S. Right. taxpayer, no less, wants us to move away from fossil fuel right. generated uh, burning cars into right into his his right into his showroom right. buy one of our and, and that, that goes to but, exactly but, but, the point but talk he, about this though what how do you produce electricity well it goes exactly with through coal, coal right yeah. exactly um, but that goes exactly to the point of is he really interested in the environment and clean energy or is he interested in getting rich in electricity electric cars because it benefits him if he was really interested in helping the environment which I think there are a lot of people in the Trump administration who are America by the way is going to decrease its emissions without the Paris Accord. We have decreased our emissions more than any other country in the world. But if he really cared about the environment, he would stay as an advisor despite not getting his way on the Paris Climate Agreement. A bit of a conflict, I agree with you there, Katie. And also, back, because the deal itself just bugs me, uh, in the same way that the uh, Iran deal bugged me. It's a bad deal. Good mission, good intentions, bad, unenforceable terms of the deal. France, Germany, and Italy already saying that the deal, quote, cannot be renegotiated. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Every deal can, by <laughs> yes, definition, can. Right. be renegotiated. Can we touch on one yes. other thing? Who signed this deal? Who's, who thought oh, it, it was a great idea for us to reduce 20, our emissions by 28%? pay the vast majority of the money that's going, uh, a transfer of wealth from us to developing nations. Who did that? President, President Obama. Obama. Thank you, sir. Right. One more thank you, President Obama. All right. Obama. Okay. Well, not surprisingly, oh. the media are pouncing <laughs> on the irreparable damage they claim the president will cause by pulling out of the climate deal. Take a listen.
And with the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement, scientists are in agreement, or a majority of them anyway, that we are going to see temperatures rise. Let's first look scientifically what that means. Well, rising seas. We could see the seas uh, continue to rise. And we could see flooding in major cities such as New York City to Shanghai. Deadlier heat waves would be more uh, abundant. We'd see droughts, wildfires, mass extinction in the natural world. Ecosystems would be disrupted. Coral reefs would bleach out in the oceans. And get this, Jake, low-lying countries such as the Marshall Islands would disappear entirely. Ebony, he's saying this about the deal. We're talking <laughs> about a deal. Right We're not talking about ultimately actions or what's ultimately going to happen in terms of emissions and, and, and he, regulation. We're talking about a specific deal. Without this specific deal, all that's going to happen? I feel like no. And if you listen to him, it sounds like it's the rapture. You're expecting exactly. half the people just vanish from the face <laughs> of the earth. We've been hearing these predictions for at least 30 years. Uh, none of this has happened. And at no point are they like, wait a minute, maybe we got something wrong. The idea that climate change is naturally, not, uh, automatically man-made and the idea that it's automatically like a Catastrophe are two logical leaps that they're making yeah. whenever you talk about right. this issue. I like I was watching let's, Jack Van Empey for a while. <laughs> let's slow it down, though, Mike. So, so I agree. That's that's a bit far of a leap. But obviously, I do think there are things we can and should be doing to be more responsible consumers sure. of our earth right. and globe. But that, to cat, I mean, everybody, I think we're all in agreement here, that is very different than applauding this as a good deal. And let me make one more point. If Trump pulled out of the agreement and said unilaterally we're still going to meet these goals, he would still get attacked because what they really want is for the U.S. to have some kind of international consensus as opposed right. to us doing anything of our own uh, abolition. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't mind us having consensus personally, but but not when it doesn't have well, an actual you benefit. Have to, you have to look at the end results. Is the Paris Climate Accord actually going to reduce the Earth's right. temperature by four degrees? Absolutely not. And this idea that they have all these predictions, which I was confused. Is that Al Gore or was that an anchor from a, another network there? All those predictions I'm pretty sure I saw Al Gore make in 2002 when his, his right. film that came out, An Inconvenient Truth, that was completely debunked, yet used in classrooms across the country to sell climate change as you said in the 80s and the 70s we were told that the earth was going to freeze right. he was talking about rising uh, sea levels i'm from arizona <laughs> arizona used to be under an ocean you can find seashells at the top of the grand canyon yes the climate changes it's been changing for a very very long time yes man may have some kind of impact on it but to act like some international community is going to use american taxpayer dollars to reduce the earth's temperature by four degrees is a fantasy land and i'm glad that the president is not but, but if you want to play fantasy land that's fine and if you have a you, you, you will get behind a president that says let's let's do this fantasy land mm -hmm. but as long as everyone is playing with the same set of rules. In other words, we can't be forced into four or three, I'm sorry, three trillion dollars of reduced GDP while China continues to, to eat our lunch in business, uh, in, in manufacturing and, and put us at a competitive disadvantage of China when they're going to be allowed, think about this, they're the number one polluter on the planet. Right. They're going to be allowed to increase their pollution for 13 but more years. But We're required to pull back or we're fined. There's a we're, difference between pollution and climate change. Right. And I think they mix the two. Nobody wants to be a polluter. They right. mix the two. No one wants to be a polluter. We can reduce pollution, but this idea of climate change embodying everything doesn't really add up. And to Eric's point, even when China does continue to do that, even if when it, the day comes where they're restricted, how do we enforce that? It's an unenforceable deal. And, well, this know. deal didn't have any enforcement mechanisms in it. That's so what I'm maybe saying. some of those would have been a, a good start for that. Okay. All right. Well, gunshots and explosions at a hotel and casino in Manila, the capital of the Philippines, sparking havoc. We'll have the latest right after this. Explosions and gunfire erupting at a big hotel and casino resort in Manila, forcing the facility into lockdown and civilians fleeing to the darkened streets. Now, there are a lot of conflicting reports during his speech in the Rose Garden a short time ago. President Trump referred to it as a terrorist attack, and there have been local reports of multiple injured. But the country's national police chief is now saying that it may have been a robbery as the motive. Clearly a chaotic situation, and this comes after ISIS-linked militants have laid siege 
to the country south over the last 10 days. But there is some good news coming out of the fight against ISIS. Today, one of the founders of ISIS, propaganda arm, reportedly was killed in his hometown during a coalition airstrike in eastern Syria. Katie, I'll start with you. ISIS took credit for this at one point. Now the police saying may, may have been robbery. Um, Either way, we're concerned that ISIS and, and terror spreading to the to the Asian countries, to, to, to spreading throughout the globe. Now. Regardless of what this situation turns out to be, the Philippines is it has a serious problem when it comes to ISIS gaining a, a, a foothold and a stronghold in the south of the country. The president there has said that it's a very serious issue. They need help with the issue. ISIS militants in the Philippines just uh, kidnapped a, a Christian priest and they sent out a hostage video. So it's certainly a concern, not just in the Philippines, but also throughout uh, Southeast Asia as well. What do you mean, yeah. Stephanie? Yeah, we know it's growing. We've been talking about it for days now. Uh, ISIS black flags going up everywhere. Yeah, Katie's absolutely right. Whether this uh, individual instance turns out to be that or not should not uh, dictate our level of grave concern that we should have over this growing problem. Uh, and again, we just really have to figure out, I, I know the whack-a-mole thing, I keep saying it, but how do we get it, get it at its root, you know, and really stop it so that it keeps, it stops, keep emerging in new places every day. Kat, what do you think of the, um, the Syrian airstrike that killed one of these ISIS founders, one of the um, original ISIS uh, leaders? I am happy that an airstrike killed an <laughs> ISIS leader, Eric. Absolutely. Of course I am. Again, but like as Ebony was saying, this is something that's spreading. It pops up over here and over here and over there. It's obviously at the root, an ideological problem and there's going to be a lot more involved in, in eventually eradicating it. Again, we don't know if they're responsible or not. ISIS, as you were saying in the break, all the time claims responsibility for things that it actually didn't do. And why wouldn't it? Because it makes it look more powerful. And the thing about terror and ISIS is a lot of their warfare is psychological, making sure that things are horrific and making sure that they're in our minds because obviously they don't have a defense like a country like the United States does as a terror group and hoping to destroy our way of life through fear. So it's also important to not let that happen. And Mike, this, the, the, we saw the video, that certainly looks more like a, a, a I mean, look, we're, I'm speculating, looks more like terror than a robbery. Well, if you look at Philippine President Duterte, he's kind of a strong man, and strong men thrive on chaos and carnage. And he's already declared martial law in parts of the Philippines, and we don't know where he's going to go from this. We might be looking at kind of things like people being thrown out of helicopters. They are looking for excuses to crack down on radical Islam, just like back in the day. It was communism that spread throughout the world, and people took a harsh stand that we didn't approve of in terms of human rights. And if you look at Hungary with Viktor Obron, and if you look at the Philippines, these people are drawing a line, and the backlash is going to start coming, and it's not going to be coming from the United States. It's been coming from these countries where the people the top really are uninhibited and kind of revel in the fact that they're uh, strong men. Mm -hmm. Katie, and, and we've talked about this time and time again, a lot of the victims, most of the victims, in fact, of ISIS terror are Muslims. Well, and it, just this week, we saw that horrible truck bombing in, in Kabul. We saw over the weekend the, the suicide bombing after the Ramadan fast ended in, uh, in Baghdad. I mean, this is a problem that affects everybody. Um, and I think if you go, go back to what the president said during his foreign trip, there are a lot of leaders in this community who are going to have to deal with how to stop this from spreading in their own communities, but also spreading throughout the world. And as uh, the point that you made, these different governments are going to have to decide what works for them. There can't be a one-size-fits-all policy when it comes to fighting terror. Every country is different. Every country is going to have a different sector of Islamic terrorism. We've seen it all over the world, different terror groups uh, banding together with each other. So they're going to have to take a hard look at what's happening in their own countries, and the United States can be there to help them in terms of providing counterintelligence and, and methods to stop that ideology. And within countries, these things are also going to be changing all the time because a lot of these areas are really unstable. Right. All right. We'll, States. we'll leave it right there. A lot more show coming up. President Trump calls unmasking the big story in the Russian probe with three top former Obama administration officials now under scrutiny by the House Intel Committee. We've got the very latest coming up next. With the number of Trump allies getting dragged into the Russia probe growing, President Trump took to Twitter earlier today, ripping the Obama administration over questions of unmasking, writing, quote, the big story is the unmasking and surveillance of people that took place during the Obama administration. On Wednesday, the House Intel Committee served the CIA, NSA, and FBI with subpoenas for documents relating to three former Obama aides, Susan Rice, John Brennan, and former UN Ambassador Samantha Power. 
Now, the inclusion of Samantha Power has raised some red flags for some analysts. Earlier today, Judge Andrew Napolitano said this. She should have had nothing to do with this unless it was for political purpose. So the unmasking is a below-the-radar screen crisis Where that occurred at the tail end of the Obama administration when they began to fear, hey, Donald Trump might really win. we got to do something about it. Okay, Michael, I appreciate the judge's enthusiasm there. <laughs> um, but here's, here's the truth, though, right? We all know, um, as much as we don't like it, unmasking's not illegal. And we know the definition. It's really a totally subjective standard. And I think that's what's really frustrating. And Eric, you pointed out yesterday how dangerous, ultimately, that is. So maybe we need to look at that standard. But as it stands now, all anybody has to say, and Susan Rice has said this, is she felt a need to know. She says, context. I needed to know who these people are. So even if you don't buy that, Where's the crime? We have political warfare in this country. We've had it for decades, and it's only now that the right has started fighting the left on mm -hmm. its own terms. Yesterday, we saw that awful comedian with that horrible uh, cartoon. As a comedian, I wasn't... Who? I, I, <laughs> Kathy, Kathy Lee Gifford, I think Sorry. her name is. Uh, I'm not even going to mention her name, but the point is, it's only when you hit these people where it hurts is that when the behavior starts to change, and that's only when the corporate press thinks it's a problem. When Republicans do something, they have, they have complete meltdowns, but when they do it, they get a free pass, so they have to be held with their feet to the fire regardless of the truth. Yeah. Can, can I, I want to push back on you a little bit here. Bring it. So unmasking <laughs> itself may or may not be illegal. I'm not sure it's not it's, it's not, not it's not well the leak is done illegal. properly it's legal but and here's the yep. problem you need to go to a fisa court to get the information uh and the fisa court is very secretive has to see national security at risk and if you can include a u.s person who's not the target of the investigation you have to mask their name so mm -hmm. if you start unmasking people's names you're violating their constitutional right at, by doing so unless there's a national security risk at heart and susan rice Unmasked General Flynn's without any national security risk whatsoever for purely political reasons. Well, we the reason that. that's important mm -hmm. is because you could have an administration, a president, who could just want to unmask everyone and, and ruin their lives and ruin Americans' lives. I appreciate that risk, Eric, and you're exactly right, which is why my answer to it is reevaluate the standard at which we can unmask. Right, absolutely. That's, that's the difference. Right. Because you might be right about Susan Rice and all of her political motivation, but the problem is from a legal standpoint. Now, civil issue, you might have a lawsuit there. Michael Flynn might consue her on that issue. Um, but criminally there is no crime there because all she has to say is she felt the need to know mm -hmm. and how do you but, prove but, she didn't but i have a question for you yes. on the legal yes. aspect of this mm -hmm. if susan rice is going to the fisa court and saying i need this person unmasked because national security is at stake but her real motivation is for political purposes isn't that lying to the court it might be lying to the court, Katie, but again, how do you prove it? How do you yeah, prove sometimes it? people do lie. Right. Sometimes people do lie. The CIA, and, and, the NSA, and the FBI say, ah, this, he's, he, there's no, he's, he poses no national security risk by remaining oh, oh, masked. Oh, I have an answer. Go ahead. By remaining masked, yep. and then a political staffer, White House staffer, unmasked this man. But the thing, no, no, let me, let me the say, Kat, I got an answer. Broken. No, here's the issue. Her answer is context. She says, I needed to have the name revealed to me so I can understand the gravity and the importance of the report. That is what she is on record in saying, and saying, and I challenge well, anybody but, to prove her otherwise. Okay, so on, you, on the record, Susan mm -hmm. Rice, mm -hmm. she specifically was asked in an interview with PBS, I believe it was, mm -hmm. did she know anything about unmasking when it came to the Trump administration, the Trump transition team? She said, absolutely not. That's I was very surprised mm -hmm. that, uh, that Congressman Nunes uh, brought that up, that that was something that was going on. And then she got caught doing it. And then she said and changed her story like she usually does and said, well, I did unmask people, but it was for the good of the country. Right, so, so that's a lie. She's but lying that, on the front end. But the issue is still, as Ebony has been saying, the issue is still that you do have that excuse. If you did want to do something for political purposes, whether Susan Rice, my suspicion is certainly that she did this for political purposes. Absolutely, I agree with you on that, Eric. But the point is people have this sort of they have this way to that's, do things for political criminal. purposes in the future because the standard no, is not. the standard no. is excuse me Eric the standard is and I quote has to provide some va some value to foreign intelligence some that's called easy for someone standard. to say and it's that, very that subjective if it's you're very using, subjective if you're using the FISA well, court for to promote a political but, agenda but, but it, all you have to do is you say that, that I agree that that's not enough and that's what libertarians have been saying and that's why we need to look at the system that creates these kind of problems and not just the individuals that are involved because this happens to be a Republican the only consequences the Susan Rice will ever have will be in the sphere of public opinion she will never have legal consequence for action like most people in any administration yeah. well and also she didn't actually break the law 
That, that is important, Eric. I understand well, we what you're know. saying. You we can... don't know. We have to. I would love to see some uh, some contact. I would love to see the, some emails. But the, here's the thing. If, you, you know if what? Susan if it was an Rice, objective standard. If Susan Rice talks to some CIA, John Brennan, for example, mm -hmm. and says, yeah, I'm going to unmask it. I know you didn't need to, but I'm going to unmask it. Please. Oh, like a confession? Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think we'll be like, like an email, that. like a smoking gun email. Listen, I, I still think they're there. I think there's. And by the way, Susan Rice is no stranger to lying to me. No, and and nobody's saying that she didn't lie. But again, a I lot of see the crime. They can testify. James Comey officially set to testify in front of the Senate one week from today. But the White House could potentially stop it. Coming right back. We're still arguing about Pfizer Court's warrant <laughs> and unmasking, but welcome back to the Fox News Specialists. Our specialists today are Katie Pavlich and Michael Nallis, and we're going to continue the conversation right now. James Comey, the former FBI director, will officially testify before the Senate Intel Committee next Thursday, one week from today, June 8th, over the Russia probe. It will be Comey's first public remarks since the reports that claimed President Trump urged him to drop the investigation into former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn. However, one idea being floated is whether the White House would try to block Comey from testifying, citing executive privilege over their personal conversations. Don't know about that, but I want to go to Ebony on this. Mm. Comey has already somehow leaked or told the investigators that he was going to talk about Donald Trump leaning on him to drop the investigation. Prior to him testifying under oath, is this a good idea for him to be talking about what he's going to testify to? No, I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's CYA. I think that's certainly why he's doing it. He's trying to get a narrative out there so that people can kind of have an expectation as to what he's going to say. Look, this is a he said, he said, ultimately. Absent tapes and absent some memo that's been authenticated by no way I can think of. Right. Uh, this is ultimately going to be about the credibility of President Trump and what's left of the credibility of Jim Comey. But it's going to be watchable TV because it's going to be an, it's going to open, an open hearing and then a private hearing after. Yeah, it's going to, it definitely is going to be great TV. Yeah, so Comey says this and then Trump will say he's lying and Comey say he's lying. People will think Trump's lying. People will think Comey's lying. Everyone on the internet will try to work it out in a court of blog with their little legal hats on from watching Law and Order SVU or however everyone seems to be an expert on all of this. It's People have so little trust in the government or its officials right now that stuff like this it doesn't it hardly even matters to the average American, which I, it matters. What actually happened absolutely matters. But in terms of the proceedings, people don't know who to believe or they've already decided ahead of time who to believe. And the other person is definitely a liar. Nobody knows who to trust. I don't know who to trust. It's very, very I, hard. Katie, I want to see James Comey after he's sworn in tell the court that he uh, that Donald Trump leaned on him and that would be probably close to impeachable. Maybe not. But but on the, on the borderline of impeachable offense. Uh, a high crime and misdemeanor, and then explain why he didn't talk about it when he was asked about it in front of a Senate hearing about a month ago. Well, well, I'm ago. sure he'll be he asked that, be asked that question, mm -hmm. but I think we should back up to this idea of the White House trying to stop this testimony from going forward. They should want James Comey yeah. to testify. Agreed. If the president is going to send a threatening message on Twitter to say, James Comey better be careful about tapes, well, let's hear James Comey's side of the story. Jim Comey also has to uh, look at his testimony from early May on yep. May 3rd yep. and reconcile what he said there when he said nobody at the Justice Department at the Justice Department has tried to stop our investigation into Russia or to drop the Flynn investigation. And he Following went that further up, and said that would be very bad. That would be it, illegal. it would be illegal. And for political purposes, the FBI has never done anything like that. Following that up, the acting FBI director, Andrew McCabe, also said the same thing. He said nobody ever no one in the White House, no one at the Justice Department has tried to impede our Russian investigation. It is something that is of the highest priority. So I think that we're getting ahead of ourselves when it comes to what we think he's going to say. And we should just let him, him talk about the things he wants. You, know, you know what's scary to me, Michael, is when our intel chiefs, I mean, back in the day, these guys, these spies were secret. They were below the radar. They were off the public uh, spectrum. Meanwhile, we're these James Comey, John Brennan. They're all becoming household names. This is dangerous for us, isn't it? I think it's wonderful. I think the more skepticism we have toward the government and these people who are spying on us, the better. I was born in the Soviet Union, and one of the great accomplishments of the right wing was to destroy that. And now we've imported the KGB in the form of the NSA, which listens to all our phone calls and reads all our emails. So I think a healthy distrust of their government is just the best possible thing for the nation. But let me just get back to this point. Trump comes from a real estate background. You can very easily see him having nothing to do with Russia and telling Comey, like, come on, let's cut the crap and move on. And yet that's going to be twisted in something like this is the 
the president telling him, and basically both sides are telling the truth. I should say I completely agree with him that the distrust is a good thing. Thank, Thank you. you. I vote. No, I've been you should have a healthy, you should not you can have a healthy distrust, but I certainly and I do. I'm with you on the NSA. I think Ed Snowden was a hero, not a traitor. But oh, I God. also think I would love I agree. that. Yeah. I, would, I would also love Amen, to see brother. our Intel chiefs. Under the radar, quietly like investigating, Hoover? sneaking, not on Americans, on foreign uh, oh, yeah, bad absolutely. guys, not on Americans. Absolutely. You know, I agree, Eric. I was thinking about that with Jim Comey, and I spent a long time defending him because I know people that work for him and, mm -hmm. and have great things to say about him, right. and he enjoyed a great reputation for a long time. But I kind of think he got into the wrong gig. Like, maybe he should have ran for office or something if he wanted. <laughs> but, no, it seems to me well, he wants a bit of a public yeah, He has an Instagram. But, but is yeah. that his fault? I mean, we have all of these politicians with Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. dragging people like Jim Comey in front of Congress to testify. And all they do is ask them political questions and demand answers. And they inherently put them into a bad place under Here's oath. where I disagree, Katie. Yes, at this point, he's being dragged in. But before all that, James Comey marched out there because he felt the need to update the American people on what was going on with Hillary. Even before that, he was an investigator on one of the Clinton, I think one of the travel gate. Or Whitewater. One of those things. Whitewater. There you go. Katie <laughs> All right. The U.S. now holding massive military exercises off the Korean Peninsula after its successful anti-intercontinental missile test. Will a show of force push Kim Jong-un to back down? Stay tuned. Many are saying the U.S. is sending a loud and clear message to Kim Jong-un. Two carrier strike groups launching a big show of force off the Korean Peninsula today, conducting military exercises with Japanese Navy ships. According to the military, a total of 12 warships and two carrier air wings are involved in the drills. They come just two days after the U.S. military successfully shot down a mock intercontinental missile for the first time. Michael, we'll start with you since you're the expert on North Korea. Yes. What say you? Well, I don't think this is a loud and clear message at all. The only message is that we have ships. Mm -hmm. So but we've been sending them Error. we've been sending them <laughs> ambiguous messages, which is the way to do it. You've had President Trump praising Kim Jong un, saying he'd like to talk to him, saying he's doing a good job being a leader, and then you have Pence and other members of the administration saying we're done talking and we're gonna take action. These are contradictory messages because we don't know what they're gonna be doing, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors when you're dealing with this country. Now we've seen something like this. This has gone back in the seventies. In the seventies, uh, the Americans wanted to prune a tree in the border between North and South Korea. The DMZ, and the, the North Koreans took that axe, chopped up those Americans. That axe is still on display. I've seen it in North Korea. And what did we do? We launched Operation Paul Bunyan. We came back with a huge amount of troops and a huge amount of ships, and we, we pruned that tree and we left the stump to give the finger to the North Korean government. So this has been going on for decades. This is not new. I, I think it's new. You know, I think it's new about this. No, because you have a Donald Trump as commander. Oh, that part's new. Well, who sent 59 new. Tomahawk <laughs> missiles into Syria. He dropped a Moab <laughs> over, over over Afghanistan. And now he's put, listen to these numbers. He's put three air, aircraft carriers, one th two there, one on its way in the region. Six destroyers will help the, those three strike groups. Two cruisers, 200 plus aircraft on those aircraft carriers, 96 vertical missile launchers. It goes on and, on. and, and each, uh, each one of these carrier strike groups typically travels uh, very quietly with a submarine as well. Sure. These are nuclear vessels. If you have that much fire, look at it. Look at those pictures. Yeah, but, you think Kim Jong Un is looking yes, out with those, with those, and then, you know, binoculars wait, going? Let, and then he's uh -oh. sending the message in the media to all people of North Korea that this is us trying to start war with. Correct. Them. And we've been engaged in annual military exercises in, in, with really North and South Korea since the 70s. They're called the Team Spirit Exercise. I talk about this in my book, and this is a source of complaint from them because they're like, "Look, you guys are basically threatening us off our shores." Yeah, but, but Michael, how, when was the last time you had three carrier strike groups in one? They city? have them do. I mean, we're not going to be striking them no, because we know not, the attacks. This is, not a, this is not an exercise. This is it's a literally an clear exercise. warning shot. Like, literally shut literally up or you're gone. No, it's yeah. not shut up. The, the idea that we're really going to say shut up and we're gone and provoke them in a nuclear armed country who can hit uh, Seoul with 10 million people, it's not that simple. There's no way. Every person in the administration has agreed that any strike in North Korea will have absolutely devastatingly catastrophic consequences. And this is a government that chose to let 10% of its population starve in the 90s rather than let in the U.S 
gun and give them food. So they have no respect for human life, even of their own citizens. So yeah, would that sure. be a declaration of war? I mean, oh, yeah, for sure. Right? I mean, if the United yeah. States launches any kind of Anything. real military of course, action yeah. against North Korea, then they will retaliate against South Korea. They say all the time that they're developing a missile that can hit the western coast of the United States. That's obviously not true, and we right. have ways to stop their missile tests to blow them up while Thank they're we're doing it. Right. Um, but I just have to say, even though the ships are just sitting there, I'm glad that the Ronald Reagan is there. The Ronald Reagan is there. That just happy. makes me happy. Can I ask Michael something, though? Mm -hmm. Michael, we have intel, right? Yeah. We have very good intel. If they do load a nuclear warhead into one of those ICBMs, right? even if one that's not has, has the range to hit the U.S., has the range to hit... Certainly as South Korea, but, right. but say Japan. Right. We don't do a preemptive strike on that missile. I am absolutely certain that President Trump sat down with the Chinese president mar lago and figured out what's the line beyond which we're not, well, not going to allow. Wouldn't it? We don't, I'm sure that would be probably even further than that because we don't want to be like Obama with Syria where there's a line and then we don't enforce absolutely, it. And absolutely. We don't, and just one more point. We don't want to tell North Korea what that line is. Right. Yeah. We have to play our cards close absolutely. to the chest. And there's, you know, he's just having such a good time right now showing off all this stuff. Right. He doesn't care what other people do. He doesn't he, he, People say, oh, you people are starving. He says, and so what? I'm stuck. Right. He does not care at all, which is what makes this so complicated. And it's the way he views himself. I mean, he, he believed he was the sexiest man. Remember that? Uh, well, that was and, and, they, they, and they <laughs> boast. I know, okay. They he's a so very sexy, wonderful, the powerful man, and he doesn't want anyone to take and, that away. And they boast that they're a shrimp among whales, and they push around bigger countries than themselves. So this is mm -hmm. a source of pride for them. Yeah, this is very special kind of crazy. Yes. Uh, from, yeah. from what you've seen, right? Yeah. So when we circle back, we will have the new appalling behavior in the wake of Kathy Griffin's Trump beheading photo after this. Time to circle back with our specialists, Katie Pavlich and Michael Malice. All right, let's circle back to the Kathy Griffin controversy, which is inspiring more gross behavior. Ken Jennings, the former big-time Jeopardy champion, is mocking reports that President Trump's 11-year-old son, Barron, saw the Griffin photo and feared it was actually his father. Jennings tweeted, quote, Barron Trump saw a very long necktie on a heap of expired deli meat in a dumpster. He thought it was his dad, and his little heart is breaking. Donald Trump Jr., Barron's half-older brother, shot back tweeting, it takes a real man to pick on an 11-year-old. Yet another low from the left, but they'll rationalize it with excuses. Comedian Jim Carrey is standing by Kathy Griffin saying, quote, we're the last line of defense and comedians are the last voice of truth in this whole thing. You know what? I agree with Jim Carrey on that. I agree with him on that. I absolutely agree with him on that. Wait. I think that the, the jokes are gross, but I think it's also wonderful that we live in a country where you can make fun of and criticize your leader in that way and not go to jail like you would in North Hold Korea. Hold on. I, I'm, I'm a humorist and the North Korea guy, and I agree with him in theory that comedians are the last voice of truth. What was the truth behind this picture? If you're going to look, I've made all sorts of offensive jokes about subjects I can't even mention at five o'clock. But the point <laughs> is, the darker the joke, the more it has to land. Right. There was no punchline there. And as for that comment of Baron, of Baron Trump, the idea that an 11-year-old wouldn't be upset by seeing his father's bloody head, I mean, right. that's just crazy. Right. They, they were bad jokes. For, for absolute sure. I don't even get what the joke It wasn't was. a joke. Oh, yeah. it, no, it was not a joke. It literally, and that's the thing. I love comedians. Like, I love Chris Rock and different people. Richard Pryor, they'll be provocative yes. and say things to make you uncomfortable. At what point do you not just get to slap the label comedian? This is for you two because you're humorous. You get to slap that label on anything because where is Kathy Griffin being a comedian in that moment? When your face is funnier than your jokes, that's when you're not a humorist. Ooh, oh, burn. burn. That's no, going to be um, tough for you on the internet. Yeah, I'm, fine with I'm, with I'm fine with you. <laughs> Look, I think that Donald Trump Jr. issued the correct response to the attack on his little brother. Mm -hmm. The kid's 11. He didn't ask for the life that he's in. Leave him alone. And he's if, adorable. If, if, yeah, and if you, if, if you really feel like um, you have to make news by attacking an 11-year-old child, then that says more about you than it does mm. about him. Good point. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Bowling? So, so the two things here. I, obviously, Kathy Griffin was despicable in my mind. I understand the free speech argument, but when you when you're talking about the president of the United States, there there are things you cannot do. I don't think you can threaten the president of the United States. But you can. She didn't threaten. She didn't threaten. It wasn't a no, will. To it, be it, to meet the standard of being out, legal, has to be a willing. But as I pointed out yesterday, Kat, I mean, Madonna said we can blow up the White House. Uh, Snoop Dogg po points a gun at the image of a president. But those aren't jokes. And it's, but, I, but my point is, it, but don't it, you look it, at Kathy Griffin doing point, that and say, you look at that, you say, I am free. We are. 
are truly free in this country that you can't worry about government retaliation for doing yes, something she, like that against the government. Me, you don't Ron, actually and I think, think CNN that was she was smart, threatening was to kill the to, president. To, to free, CNN Absolutely. was smart and wise to cut ties with them. But this is different. This Ken Jennings loser is so desperate for attention. He's got to attack an 11 year old boy. I mean, Unbelievable! You have there are, there there are no boundaries when it comes. To, there are no boundaries jokes. on the left when it comes to the Trump family, and that's how they have to be dealt with in response. Well, I will say this though, and that's you can have that argument. That's fine, Michael. But people did horrible and gross things to President Obama. I saw President Obama in a noose. I saw President Obama with a target on his face, and it, many people were not protecting or defending Malia or uh, Sasha around that either. So I, I agree with the notion that the kids, especially when they're under 18, yes. should just be off limits. Absolutely. Period. I would just hope that we can come to a place in a very divided time that you don't attack children, yes. despite how yes, you feel abhorrent you feel about right. their present or the, their their parents. Unless they're, what they're annoying. Called, unless they're annoying, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the so, kids. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. But no, I, I don't think it was right for people to attack the Obama girls, and it's not right for anyone to, to attack Baron. Trump. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you to our Fox News specialists today, Katie Pavlich and Michael Malice, and we thank you all for watching. Make sure to follow us on social media at Specialist FNC on Twitter and Facebook. Remember, five o'clock will never be the same. Special report is next. President Trump fulfills a major campaign promise pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord.